This is a day of new beginnings in the light of Christ. We have found our hope. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Lake Fenton United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Vincent Slocum. I'm so pleased to have you joining us in worship this morning. Now, whether you're a longtime member of Lake Fenton United Methodist or you're relatively new to our congregation, maybe you've only recently begun joining us on our worship live streams on Facebook or YouTube. No matter who you are and no matter where you are at this morning, I invite you to greet one another with a sign of God's peace on the comment stream, either to the bottom or off to the side of, of your screen. Let us greet one another with a sign of God's peace this morning. No matter who you are, no matter where you come from this morning, we want you to know that here in this place you are safe, here in this place you are welcome, here in this place... You are home. We believe that this house belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. And as such, it is open for absolutely everyone. We are so pleased to have you joining us this morning. Here you are welcome. Now this morning we're continuing our sermon series, Crying Out in the Wilderness. For the past few weeks, we've been sharing stories and lessons from the life of Jesus Christ and what they have to teach us in difficult and unsettling times in our lives. What surprising lessons we can learn from the life and ministry of, of Jesus in times such as these. And we'll be continuing that sermon series today with, with a story from the wedding at Cana, probably the most famous party in all of history. Now, before we begin our worship with song, this morning I invite you to pause. Reach out, feel God's Holy Spirit with you. The space that we share together is holy, is sacred space. No matter where you are, God is present with you just as surely as he is here in this place with me. Breathe deeply of his Holy Spirit, exhale frustration, anxiety. Breathe in his love and abundance, exhale fear and worry. Continue breathing, my friends, as we prepare to begin our worship this morning with song. My friends, rumor has it that there's some sort of football game on TV today. I'm not much of a sports guy, so I really don't know much about that. But, but normally, in any other given year, the, today would be a day when people all over the country would be throwing on their 
favorite jersey and painting their face and throwing huge parties and raiding grocery store snack departments for supplies and just in general making a great big fuss over about 40 or so odd guys running back and forth after a after a football on on a field of grass again i'm not a big football guy Actually, Super Bowl Sunday for me most years is a day when I go out and do most of my grocery shopping because I know that come four or five o'clock in the evening, most of the stores are going, to going, are going to be entirely empty. I can blow through just about any grocery store counter in no time. And so usually Super Bowl Sunday, Super Bowl Sunday is, is a shopping day or maybe I, I go to the movies and, and get to watch a movie with the theater all to myself. Self. That's how I usually celebrate Super Bowl Sunday. However, as with all other things in this past year, this year is different. As the pandemic continues to rage around us, many people are being forced to hunker down in their homes and watch the football game with just their families or organize online Zoom-based viewing parties and, and whatnot. Many people are foregoing the usual in-person festivities that they would usually have. I am foregoing my usual trip to the movie theater and the grocery store that I would usually go on. Now, whichever team it is that, that you will be watching or whatever it is you will be doing this evening to hold your attention while you are not watching football, <laughs> uh, but if you are watching the game, whichever team you are, you are watching, whatever team you are rooting for, whichever team you are praying for today, this morning I invite you now to join with me in, in a moment of of community prayer. Most merciful God, come to you again this Sunday morning on yet another day, which would usually be filled with grand festivities and large gatherings that we are having to forego. Once again, we are being asked to shoulder the burden of sheltering in place and social distancing that this terrible pandemic has wrought. With every passing time, the burden starts to feel just a little bit heavier. Lord, as the days grow colder, the nights grow longer, and tradition after tradition passes and continues to feel different. Lord, our spirits are beginning to fall. Lord, the burden is starting to weigh on us. And so, Lord, this morning, we ask that you reach out. Be with us. Lord, this morning, remember how you launched your ministry at a wedding in Cana all those years ago that you chose to launch your ministry out of a place of joy. And so we reach out for your joy, Lord, this morning, for your peace, for your comfort, for the strength that helped you to stand as you carried the cross. Strengthen us to carry our crosses. Pour your grace out upon us to help us lighten this burden that continues to weigh upon us. Lord, we ask that you pour out your grace and your comfort upon us, and we ask it in the words that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. 
My friends, at this time, I'd like to invite Patricia Whitaker to help share our scripture reading this morning from John's gospel, the story of Jesus at the wedding in Cana. One of the first acts that Jesus, one of the first great acts that Jesus undertook when starting out his, his ministry. This morning, I invite you to listen to God speaking to you through the words of scripture. Today's scripture reading was from John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood sti six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, so they are filled to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where he had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. This, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. One of the first groups that I started working with in my time with Habitat for Humanity was a group called the University Avenue Corridor Coalition, or the UACC, as everyone called it. Now, the UACC was a group of residents and businesses from around Flint's University Avenue Corridor. It's the old Fourth Avenue for anyone who's familiar with the Flint area. It's a short stretch of road that runs from downtown Flint down to Kettering University before it eventually turns into Sunset Drive. Now, the goal of the group was to bring residents and businesses together to improve safety and create beauty along the University Avenue corridor. Now at this point in my career, I was all about rolling up my sleeves and getting right down to work, right? I had almost no patience for long grandstanding speeches or puffed up committees. And yes, I am fully aware of the irony of that statement given that most of my job now consists of making long, grandstanding speeches, and attending committee meetings. <laughs> However, at this point, I'd seen more than enough of committees whose only real goal seemed to be to pat one another on the back. High five brigades, as one of my colleagues used to, used to call them. So that goal of the UACC to improve safety and create beauty along the University Avenue corridor, that really appealed to me. I really appreciated that. As much as I loved the goal of UACC, and as excited as I was to be a part of it in the early days, there were a couple of things that they did at the UACC that really started to bug me, and, and not even just a little bit, but a lot, like a lot, a lot. Right? It, was, it was the kind of annoyed that's so loudly self-righteous that people around you start going, really? Who cares? Right? Why do we keep talking about this? It isn't even that big a deal. But I was annoyed. And I was right. And I just knew it. You see, the first thing that they did that began to annoy me was that they had each of their meetings catered. At first, I kind of appreciated that. The meetings took place during my lunch break, so it was nice that there was a hot meal waiting for me every time that I had to go to one of those meetings. 
right? They also bought all of the food from local businesses and restaurants. So in a way, it was also supporting entrepreneurship and the local economy. And at first I liked it. It was, it was good. However, after a couple of months of catered meetings, I started to think, you know, there's so much need in the community. Why are we spending all of this money on food? At least a third of it's going to go to waste anyway. Why don't we spend this money on something meaningful like, oh, you know, creating beauty and improving safety along the University Avenue corridor? <laughs> now, after a while, I started complaining to other people about it until finally I started to sound like the parent at the dinner table who's always screaming about starving children in China when you don't want to eat your carrots. <laughs> now, the, the other thing that they did that really used to get under my skin was at every meeting they would dedicate at least a portion of the agenda to letting everyone in the group share some good news or give updates to the group. Sometimes local restaurants would come by and let people know about new specials that they were offering or local institutions would drop in and pass out flyers for upcoming events. But most of the time, people in the group would just share some kind of good news, right? Maybe a sidewalk was being it replaced in front of their house or a nearby street light had been fixed. Now this was by far the most popular part of the meetings. And every time someone shared some piece of good news, everyone in the room would clap and cheer. Neighbors would pat one another on the back. And eventually this agenda item started to crowd everything else off the agenda and I thought, you've got to be kidding me. We're spending at least half our meeting literally patting one another on the back. What a ridiculous waste of time. We could be organizing cleanups or food drives. We could start a neighborhood watch or plant a community garden. Instead, we're just sitting here clapping at one another because Good Beans Cafe just added muffins to their menu. <sighs> now, the most irritating thing of all was that the more irritated I got, the more everybody else really started to take an interest in the UACC. Over time, the meetings grew to more than three times their original size. Some meetings had as many as a hundred people that attended. It turns out that a lot of people will turn out on a Wednesday afternoon if you clap loud enough for them and give them free food and beverages. <laughs> it also turns out that they were on to something that I in all my self-righteous cynicism, clearly didn't understand. Because you see, the more and more people came out and celebrated one another at these meetings, the more motivated people became to get out and start making a difference in the community. Eventually, some of the local foundations even started to take notice. And as people continued to rally, around the UACC's mission, a remarkable thing happened. People started to get things done. Foundations made money available for improvements. Neighbors started talking to one another about ways that they could make a difference in their community together. The corridor actually did get safer. People really did create beauty along the University Avenue corridor. And it all sprang from this place, this meeting where people could get together and celebrate one another. And yes, sometimes pat themselves on the back. Now in today's reading, we hear one of the most famous 
stories in Jesus' ministry. The wedding at Cana. A story of how Jesus became one of history's most famous wedding guests by turning water into wine. The story takes place in John's gospel. In fact, as the good news of Jesus is told in John's gospel, this is the first miracle that Jesus ever performs. Which means that before he ever calmed the storm or walked on water, before the miracle of loaves and fishes, before he fed 5,000 people, Before he healed the sick and the blind, the lame and the deaf, before raising Lazarus from the dead, long before his ultimate triumph on the cross, Jesus was turning water into wine. We actually know a few things about the wine that Jesus made that day. You see, first of all, We know from archaeological evidence that wine in Jesus' time was much stronger than wine is today, sometimes as much as two and a half times stronger than most modern wines. Second of all, we know that Jesus' wine was so good that the host actually thought that they'd been holding out on him all night. You've been holding back the good wine until now, he says to everyone. Which means that not only did Jesus turn water into wine, but he turned water into really good and really strong wine. Right? This would have been the kind of wine that could knock you on your tail and still keep you coming back for more. But that's not all. You see, we also know how much of this really good and really strong wine that Jesus made that day. A scripture tells us that the wedding guests filled six jars full of water, each of which held as much as 30 gallons of water. Which means that when Jesus turned that water into wine, he wasn't just making a little extra wine to help keep the party going. Nope. He made somewhere in the area of around 180 gallons worth of wine to keep that party going. I actually did the math and 180 gallons is the equivalent of over 900 bottles worth of wine, which brings us to the amazing realization that for his first great act upon this earth, his first great work of ministry in this world, Jesus Christ, God made flesh, the salvation of all humanity, chose to make over 900 bottles worth of really good and really strong wine. (laughs) Now, either one of two things must have been true about that wedding once Jesus had made all of that really good and really strong wine. And actually, we don't know which is the case, but either of these possible truths reveal something that I think is amazing about Jesus' character. Actually, it doesn't even really matter which one is true. Well, the first possibility is that this was just an average-sized wedding. Maybe a couple hundred people at most. In which case, there would have been more than more wine than anyone possibly could have drank in one night. People could have drank and drank and drank and drank and still had gallons of this really good and really strong wine left over. I love this possibility. See, not only Does it make an earth-shattering statement about how abundantly Jesus gives of his grace and his glory? 
But it also tells us that Jesus chose to reveal himself, to begin his ministry on this earth, surrounded by the kind of flamboyant enthusiasm that can only be produced at an average-sized wedding with over 900 bottles of wine. It tells us that Jesus chose to begin his ministry surrounded by people going, you know, Jesus, you're okay. I remember you when you were just this big, but now you're this big. And you're okay. Right? I mean, 900 bottles of wine. <laughs> That would have been like Caribbean pirate schooner levels of, shall we say, merriment. It means that Jesus chose to begin his ministry among humanity at its most absolutely ridiculous. He would have chosen to begin his ministry among humanity's most unbearably awkward and most shamelessly sentimental most embarrassingly hopeful shenanigans. I love that. But there's also another possibility. And maybe this wasn't an average sized wedding after all. You see, as best we can tell, the village of Cana, where the wedding took place, was probably a pretty small village, there probably weren't more than a thousand people who lived there, which means that this was also probably a fairly poor village. Like most poor small village villages, Cana was probably a place that was also rich in community. A place where the entire village, all 1,000 of them, would come together to throw a wedding, to celebrate the beginnings of love between a young couple whom they have loved and helped to raise. A place where neighbors provide their own handmade flower arrangements and decorations. A place where local fishermen and farmers bring out their best harvest to help prepare a wedding feast, where village singers and musicians play their best and their loudest to help start the young couple, their dear friends, off right. A place where village fathers shake hands the hardest and where village mothers make their best desserts from what few ingredients they have. Perhaps the village of Cana was a place full of people who made every wedding an opportunity to find abundance, where there was very little to go around. And perhaps it was at that kind of wedding a wedding which found the whole village celebrating and pouring out love upon one another that Jesus chose to begin his ministry. Perhaps it was among those people that he first chose to pour out his abundance upon the world. What better place to start than from joy? Let's pray. God of abundance, God of joy. Lord, we thank you for all of the many ways that you continue to bless us, even in these difficult times. In times where there seems to be too little to go around. A time when people are desperately waiting for vaccines and health coverage. Your grace, your love, your abundance continues to be poured out upon this world. For that, we thank you. 
Lord, this morning we ask that you soften our hearts, that we may be a voice of celebration and encouragement in a hurting community. We always have the tenderness to pat one another on the back and to celebrate even the smallest of successes, to create abundance out of very little. Amen. Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hand has made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, the power throughout the universe display then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god How great thou art, how great thou art. When through the woods and forest glades I wander and hear the birds sing sweetly in the tree. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and see the brook and feel the gentle breeze, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art! How great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. And when I that God, his son, did sparring, sent him to die. I scarce can take it in. That on my cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art.
This morning, I just have one quick announcement that I want to make before we, clo before we close out our worship with a word of blessing. As some of you may have noticed that, that worship looks just a little bit different today, that, that things have changed just, just a little bit, and there's, there's a reason for that. This past week, Lake Fenton hired our own Patricia Whitaker to serve as digital worship coordinator for on a temporary basis. This past week, I started graduate school for my continuing education at Methodist Theological Seminary of Ohio. This is an exciting development and, and is a new opportunity for myself and, and for my ministry and, and an opportunity that, that will ultimately benefit Lake Fenton as well, I, I would hope. Uh, but it also means that I have less time to devote to editing and putting together worship services. And so for the next few weeks, while we continue to worship online through Facebook and through YouTube, Patricia Whitaker will be organizing musicians and singers to help continue to fill our worship services with rich music. She'll be providing scripture readers every week as she herself has, has served as the scripture reading for this morning. And she is also editing and putting together all of our worship services and uploading them online. Now, those of you who are longtime members of Lake Fenton, know how talented and how dedicated Patricia is. Just this past Christmas, we were blessed by her talents through the online Christmas pageant that she and her mother, Karen, put together uh, that was absolutely fantastic. Karen and Tricia knocked it out of the park and did an absolutely amazing job with that. And so we're so excited to now have her talents every single Sunday aimed at enriching and providing quality worship experiences to all of our Lake Fenton members. We're so blessed by her talent and so blessed by her faithfulness. We are so grateful that she has stepped up in this way and is helping. And myself, personally, a very grateful and, and very tired pastor gives his gives his sincerest thanks for, for stepping up in this way. So in the next few weeks, if things start to look and feel just a little bit different, that's, that's why we may be experimenting with, with different formats and, and playing around with different styles of worship. I, I promise that, that we will all get through this together and, and it will be all for the better, as, as I'm sure you know uh, from, from knowing Trisha. And so this morning, I invite you all to receive this word of blessing. May you always celebrate one another with joy. And may the blessings of God, the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit be with you always. My friends, I love you deeply. God loves you even more. Go forth in peace. Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hand has made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, the power throughout the universe displayed then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god how great thou art.